On this show, we're driven by curiosity. We want to chart a path forward. Best people, best conversations. We're on a journey and it's just getting started. All right, everybody, we are back. We are live. I am Jack Murphy. This is the Jack Murphy Live podcast. And today we've got a fantastic author, a scholar, a senior fellow at the Claremont Institute. His name is Glenn Elmers. We're going to get to him in just one second. I do want to put in front of you guys Jack Brunch, jackbrunch.com. We're doing a nationwide tour, working our way down this list here. We've gone to New York. We've gone to Tampa. We are on our way to Nashville uh, this weekend, 1024 jackbrunch.com food fellowship and fun come down meet some people you know break bread drink wine with people that see the world the way that you do it's an uplifting experience everybody has a great time we've got 60 or 70 people coming out come on down get tickets also for austin northern california denver los angeles we're going to do that in orange county because screw the vax mandates seattle and then back to washington dc so come check that out i really appreciate it like I said, we've got coming up right here, we have got Glenn Elmers. He is a author. He's written a fantastic book called The Soul of Politics. You should go out and get it right now on Amazon.com. I have read the whole thing and gone back to dig in even deeper because there's so many powerful questions, not only truths, but questions contained therein. I'm really happy to welcome today a senior fellow from the Claremont Institute, Glenn Elmers. How are you doing, bud? Great. Awesome to be here. Thanks, Jim. Hey, it's my pleasure. I'm excited to talk to you. As we were saying in the pre-show, uh, I feel a less prepared for this show than I have for so many others, even though I've done all the reading. I've been steeped in all of the conversations with Strauss and Jaffa and Claremont. I've been studying the American founding. I've been reading the Bible. I've been covering all the things, except for Shakespeare. I haven't been studying Shakespeare, which is in the book also. And I got to tell you, uh, there is so much in here. I don't even know where to start. So I have big questions. I've got little questions. Let's do some, let's do some uh, scene setting here uh, for, for a second. So can you introduce yourself and uh, give us an idea of who you are and why it is that you came to, to write this book? Sure, sure. So I'm affiliated with the Claremont Institute, have been for a very long time. I went to graduate school out in Claremont to, over 20 years ago and studied with Jaffa. Uh, he had retired from teaching officially, but was still <laughs> very much around teaching informally. Uh, you know, graduate students would, would go to his office. He had appropriated some space in the basement of the library and would hold court there and answer people's questions. And I was working part-time at the Claremont Institute and he was always around there. Uh, the Institute was founded by some of his students in 1979 and he sort of still hung around and taught and was available. Um, I didn't quite uh, finish my PhD and then took a long hiatus. Uh, came to uh, Washington as a political appointee in some Republican administrations, did some political work, and then took a job as a bureaucrat, which wasn't very satisfying. I bet and not. then, so Jaffa, yeah, no, <laughs> it was not satisfying, uh, but it paid the bills. But uh, Jaffa died in 2015, and then Larry Arn, the president of Hillsdale College, who was one of Jaffa's students and one of the founders of Claremont, acquired his papers. Uh, Jaffa, you know, uh, which is, it was in Claremont for a very long time, but wasn't necessarily the favorite person of the administration there. And, and Larry thought they could do a better job of, of taking care of the papers, and, and they have. And uh, those became available, and I was sort of looking for a change of pace. And I thought, well, you know, no one's really looked at these things. No one's really done an entire book on, on Jaffa. So maybe I could do that. And I made some arrangements and took a year off and, and dug into his, his uh, letters and his unpublished material there and uh, came out with this book on, it's not really a biography, it's more of sort of an intellectual look at his thought and, and why a lot of his insights are still relevant today. That's awesome. So, so Harry Jaffa is a student of Leo Strauss, right? Right. And uh, Strauss is a word that we hear quite a bit. Can you explain to the viewers who may not be as nerded up as we all are, uh, what it's people true. what people may mean when they say Straussian. Right. So Strauss fled Nazi Germany in the 30s, spent a little time in England, then came to the United States, 
taught mostly at the University of Chicago, although first at the New School for Social Research in New York, and that's where Joppa met him, and Joppa was one of his first PhD students. Uh, and Strauss almost single-handedly revived the serious study of the Western philosophical tradition, not as just something uh, out of historical curiosity, but as a real source of wisdom, that there might be enduring truths that we can learn, especially from the Greeks like Plato and Aristotle, but really the whole Western tradition. And again, almost single-handedly uh, developed an entire school uh, that revived political philosophy as a serious search for truth. And Jaffa, as I said, was one of his first students and not, again, the only one to turn to America, as many other Straussians did, but one of the first and certainly one of the most forceful and, and you might say patriotic of Strauss's students to apply political philosophy to understanding and defending uh, the American founding and the American regime. You know, uh, when I first interviewed Brian Williams, president of Claremont Institute, I think it was episode number 19. And I think, I don't know where we are now. We're like up into the seventies. It's crazy. But uh, I remember just being floored at the notion that people had stopped studying the ancients. They had stopped studying yeah. Plato and stopped studying uh, Aristotle. And that to me, maybe it's just because of the people I run around with, the stuff that I read, or a testament to the power of Strauss and Jaffa's legacy. Yeah. But it seemed insane to me that any student of political philosophy or philosophy today, or even contemporary just pop stuff, wouldn't have a connection to Aristotle and Plato. And I'm... Uh, interested to explore whether or not that this is still spreading this notion of like studying the ancients or if it's contained within what do you think if it's contained within the, our little our micro universe of uh claremont folks it certainly has spread i mean certainly on the right people take this idea uh much more seriously um whereas you know 50 70 years ago uh on both right and left uh there was this idea that we're sort of trapped in our culture. Um, not entirely, um, certainly, you know, religious people would see the Bible as a source of transhistorical truth. But when Jaffa, uh, so Jaffa studied uh, English at Yale, and this is in uh, late 30s, early 40s. When he got there, he said, studying the past, especially the great thinkers of the past, was like a tour through a wax museum. It was a land of dead souls. And so even, he was so sort of self-consciously conservative. And even he sort of had just imbibed this idea. Historicism is the technical word for it, right? We're all trapped in our little historical era, our culture, and we can't ever really get beyond that. Um, that was really a universal idea. I mean, certainly among any, any educated person, certainly at every college. And that has changed a little bit. I mean, certainly our intellectual class at the Ivy Leagues, you'll still get this idea, right? There's, there's no objective morality. There's no permanent truth. Uh, there's nothing we can learn from those guys except maybe as uh, knowing something about, uh, you know, Aristotle or Plato as an example of a of a Greek aristocrat, but not as a source of real truth. Um, so um, I would say at the elite universities that dogma is still there, but but Strauss has gone a long way to sort of challenge it and undermine it, uh, and that really has changed. Yeah. Well, I mean, historicism is is the vehicle. And could you just describe very briefly uh, for folks what historicism is and, and why it has an appeal to people? Let's steel man that for a sec. Yeah. So uh, the strongest argument uh, for it is progress. Right. And a lot of this has to do with the, the, uh, the power of science and the power of technology. Right. So. Uh, every year, science gets better, and this has been going on, you know, since time immemorial. Uh, we master nature, we develop better tools, we learn more about matter and motion, uh, and this gives us greater understanding of the world we live in, the ability to manipulate the world. And it's very, very easy to get from that to the idea that uh, our morals have changed and improved and progressed. Right? We we. Um, and there is a little bit of truth to that, and, and certainly in the modern world, uh, the advance of liberal democracy uh, sort of gives some credence to this. I mean, on the other hand, probably the most barbaric century maybe in world history, the 20th century, <laughs> is also a product of the modern world, right? So there's certainly evidence against the idea that we're always progressing morally. But the, but the power of science and its constant 
uh, development uh, lapses very easily to the idea that there's progress in every sphere. And so the idea that we would go back to a bunch of ancient Greeks to learn anything uh, just seems silly to people who are uh, infatuated with the idea of, of scientific progress and assume that it applies to everything. Right. So one of the things that I was struck by uh, in my time at the Lincoln Fellowship of Claremont this last summer uh, was just continuing to think about this notion of human nature in relationship to everything else that's progressing, right? It's very clear that science and our understanding of science rather, because I guess the physical world isn't really progressing, but our understanding and ability to manipulate it uh, is progressing. Our, our technology and health and media and communications, all these things, uh, even our ideas of like how to implement government, all these things have changed. But like, has human nature and and I have I have like a I have um, a uh, evolutionary psychologist coming on very soon, Bo, Bo Weingard, to discuss this very issue. Has human nature fundamentally or materially changed in the last hundred years, five hundred years, thousand years, five thousand years? What do you think? I would say no. Jaffa would say no. Strauss would say no. Uh, and one strong bit of evidence for that, aside from uh, evolutionary biology, and I kind of have a little bit of a side interest in evolutionary biology. I got into the paleo diet a couple of years ago and then sort of just got curious about some of this. And, um, you know, we're still hardwired in many ways uh, as hunter gatherers. And one of the big problems with this is a whole separate conversation from political philosophy, but, sure. but there, <laughs> there's a lot of reasons why a lot of features of modern society are bad for us, uh, even beyond the moral political realm diet and, and, and so forth. Uh, but one reason we know, just to stick with, with morals and politics, one reason we know we haven't changed that much is if we do take Plato and Aristotle, just to name the most famous guys, if we do take them seriously and start reading them. It turns out, wow, they're talking about exactly the same thing. So, you know, read Aristotle's great treatise on, on, on the good life, on the happy life, on the virtues called the Nicomachean Ethics. It's really about what does it take to be a good person? How do you develop the kind of character that will not make you just good, but happy? Because for Aristotle, to be good and to be happy really meant the same thing. And it turns out it makes perfect sense, right? It like you read it, if you read it and take it seriously and just keep an open mind, you'll like, yeah, courage, it's the same. Moderation, it's the same. And it turns out even the more sort of problematic one, justice. Okay, yeah, it turns out justice giving people, you know, equal things to the degree they're equal and unequal things to the degree they're unequal. That's still true. <laughs> so you can just see it for yourself uh, in a way if you, if you keep an open mind. Yeah, it's it's fascinating to me. Um, and, and I uh, I have lost religion. I never really took it as a kid. I was bar mitzvahed. I was half Catholic, half Jewish. I was bar mitzvahed and went to mass. So nothing, nothing ever stuck for me. And uh, I have been uh, on a path of rediscovery uh, in the last couple of years. And it's been accelerating very much lately. And one of the things that has given and sort of buttressed this search is that is is coming to this understanding that human nature hasn't fundamentally changed. And then I ask myself, right. well, why hasn't human nature fundamentally changed? And then, well, if you read the Bible, it says that because man was created in the image of God. And if he's created in the image of God, I'm assuming God isn't, prog isn't progressive or historicist. And so maybe human nature isn't, isn't bound to change. And I, these are just my lay interpretations of what I'm reading. I don't know if that's right or wrong or not. Uh, but uh, it has helped me come to uh, have more of an appreciation for universal truths, underlying substrates of society and culture and civilization that may that may have not changed um, over time, even though we have totally uh, the modern philosophy in general has totally sort of dropped it through historicism and progressivism and positivism, which I have rediscovered the definition by reading your book again there too, right? Which is that nothing, nothing exists that can't be proven basically. Right. Uh, right? right. So right. Uh, I, I'm again, in pre-show, I explained, I'm not a philosopher. I am just a guy with a mic. So I'm learning and I know uh, the audience appreciates it when uh, I ask some basic <laughs> questions like that, but to continue on, on our path here. Right. So I have, I do have a thread <laughs> that we're following and, um, you know, the Aristotle and, and, and Plato, they, they, they established ideas of how to be good and what a good po po political system looks like. 
Uh, and then over time, it was lost and swallowed up to historicism and progressivism, etc. And then uh, Strauss uh, sort of reinvigorated uh, the study. But I think we're skipping over the founding. And I think the link yeah. here between uh, the ancients, the founding, and today, and I think that's where Strauss and Jaffa come in. So what is your understanding of the founders' relationship to Aristotle and the ancients? Uh, and then somehow we're going to get to Lincoln as well in this, co in this conversation. So, Sure. Yeah, a lot of ground to cover. So um, <laughs> Five minutes, go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so uh, Strauss really had his hands full, in a way, just dealing with the theoretical uh, element, right? just to revive the serious study of political philosophy, to take it seriously, to challenge various modern dogmas and doctrines that arose out of modern philosophy. There's a whole story there about how, in a way, mankind abandoned the rational inquiry of truth. You know, people sort of know that's what postmodernism leads to, right? There is no truth. Uh, we just make it up. Uh, there's really no, there's nothing out there that's objectively true. Strauss, uh, again, sort of had his hands full dealing with that on the theoretical level, uh, although he was a great admirer of, of America, and he was very concerned with, with the political implications of what happened in modernity. It was really Jaffa who turned that specifically to America. And so in the same way that Strauss said, look, we can still learn something from Plato and Aristotle, Jaffa thought, maybe we can still learn something from Madison and Jefferson, and maybe what the Declaration says about tyranny, and justice and the right political order is true, not just true in 1776, but true today. And he really, in a way, devoted his whole life to articulating that proposition and defending the founding, the principles of the founding, uh, the theory of the founding as true, uh, because it reflects human nature. It reflects the true account of how people can organize themselves in a political community that will protect our rights and allow us to uh, be happy. And the founders, do you, do you think that they believed that they were creating a political system that was couched in universal truths and therefore universally applicable? Or, or was it more custom suited to the time and the people and the historical era that they found themselves in? This is something I'm struggling with right now. Right. So um, the whole idea of historicism, uh, this little technical term we've been talking about, doesn't really emerge until uh, sometime after the, the America's founding. It emerges from a Greek, from a from a German thinker named Hegel and others. There's there are other people, Rousseau and others, who play a part in that. But and at the time of the of the founders, there wasn't this wasn't really a dominant idea in modern philosophy. But even a, apart from that, one really important lesson that Jaffa liked to emphasize was that the founders were practical men. They weren't primarily philosophers. And so they looked, they read a lot of political philosophy. They read, you know, there's a famous letter from Jefferson talking about the sources of the Declaration of Independence. And he mentions Aristotle and Cicero, Locke, John Locke, and Sidney, Algernon Sidney, two ancients and two modern, two modern thinkers, right? And so the framers were very practical. You know, there's a Greek word, phronomoi. They were prudent men. They applied prudence, practical wisdom to, to achieve uh, a, a political object, which was to found a new nation on the on the best uh, basis that they could derive. And so they they uh, took what they found useful from ancient, from modern, from history, from politics, from law, from economics, from military history. And they did think that the regime they were establishing reflected human nature. I mean, the whole reason that they were drawing from all of these different sources is because that they they thought there were permanent things that they could combine. Uh, in a way that that uh, uh, would secure people's rights uh, and esta establish justice, as the Constitution says. So yeah, no, they were definitely not enthralled to this idea of you know a linear progress of history uh, where we're just sort of uh, trapped in our own little uh, cultural amber, <laughs> so to speak. Right, right. Well. <sighs> Alexander Hamilton said that the government must be uh, fitted to the people like a uh, a cloak to the body or a suit to the to the man, which implies. Right. And, he, and then he goes on to say that what would be reasonable in Washington D.C. would be silly in Paris and preposterous in Petersburg. Or I'm paraphrasing. Uh, yeah. So so I, I I read that, and 
I and then I read John Jay talk and define uh, what the American people were at the time. They were born together by language and history and custom and and blood and war and experience and to yeah. create an American people. So when you take this idea, uh, the cloak fitted to the people, and then you take the idea from Jay that the American people were unique and especially at that time, it's a particular time. Was the 1789 government fitted to a people in a way that's universally applicable for whatever people you put in that jacket? Doesn't seem like it to me if you take these two ideas together. And or no. also, uh, what if the people who are wearing the cloak change? What if they get fat? What if it's different people? What if it's right. a short guy? What if it's a dumb guy? How does how does that work? Tied together with the previous question I just asked you about whether or not the founders thought that these were like universal truths in a universal sort of uh, political uh, regime that they had created. Right. So I only uh, gave sort of half the story, and that's because we were looking at one error, which is the error that there's no there's no objective reality, there's no permanent truth, there's no uh, uh, enduring uh, morality out there. Um, so the, that's that's one error. The other error is to think that there's only theoretical truth, right? Um, politics is always a combination of form and matter. This is a really great lesson out of Aristotle's politics. Uh, every regime has to combine an, an idea of justice, a system, a plan, a constitution, a theory with the particular character of the people. And that's the part you were just mentioning. Um, and so you get both of these errors in a way. Uh, the hyper traditionalists, the hyper what are called paleoconservatives, tend to overemphasize uh, the particular character of the people, and that is super important. And Jaffa was clear on that. Um, the founders were clear. Uh, liberal democracy does not work everywhere. You know, we see this with the failure in Afghanistan, right? Uh, the supposedly smartest people in the world missed this very, very basic idea that you can't just impose liberal democracy on a people who don't have the habits, the customs. They don't have uh, an understanding of where rights come from. Uh, they're not enlightened. That's the term that the founders would have used. Uh, you know, they don't have they don't have religious opinions that are that are uh, compatible with with liberal democracy. And so you can't just impose it, right? The form and the matter have to go together. The form is the idea, the concept of justice. The matter is the character, the habits, the, the moral customs, the religious opinions, and both of those have to fit. And so Afghanistan is one error, and the complete rejection of theory, the idea that only the particular matters, that's the other error. And the, the trick is to get them to work together. That was an excellent non-answer, sir. I'm going to ask you one more time. <laughs> I'm going to ask you one Sorry. more time. <laughs> okay, let's try it a different route. Do you think the form here, I'm sorry, do you think the matter here has changed? That's my question. Has the matter in America changed, necessitating a change in the form? Yes. Okay. I wasn't trying to duck your question. I just got caught up talking about Aristotle <laughs> and lost, <laughs> lost my train of thought. Uh, but I'm not ducking it. Yeah. So the character of the people has changed a lot. And that means that uh, if, the, if the character of the people no longer fits with the form, then you have to sort of step back and, and reappraise things. Now, how you do that is a difficult question. It's, it's, a, it's ultimately the job of a statesman who understands both sides to understand, okay, how do we modify things now? The character of the people has changed. We don't have the same habits. We don't, uh, most people don't know where their rights come from, right? In the way that the declaration explains it. Uh, we're not as good about both asserting our own rights and respecting the rights of other people. Uh, we don't still have we don't educate people in the habits of self-government the way we used to. And so when all of that falls away, the customs, uh, the virtues necessary, uh, then, this, then the, the form, the system, the plan, the theory isn't going to work as well. Now, what precisely you do, you know, I have my own opinions on that. Other friends of mine associated with Claremont have their opinions on that. Um, but ultimately, that that's requires a kind of a genius in practical wisdom, a kind of a statesmanship to say, okay, what exactly, what's, what do we do A, B, C, and D to fix it? And you know, everyone has their own thoughts on that. I don't have some secret answer to that one. 
Well, I'm very curious to hear what your own personal thoughts are on the matter. And I'm just going to tell, it's funny, man. I interview a lot of philosophers and you can have a two hour conversation with a philosopher and never once hear what they actually think. Cause they're always like, well, this guy said that. And this guy said that. And if you put it in the terms of this and blah, 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 blah. So sometimes I have to be like, all that side, dude, and just tell me what you think. I I'll tell you what I think. Uh, you mentioned you mentioned all kinds of ways that the matter has changed. Blood, blood is a big one, you know. And look, my my yep. family came here late nineteenth century, so you know I, I'm not a son of the a revolution or anything like that. But I, I do understand how the blood has changed, custom has changed, language has changed, everything has changed. You even mentioned uh, people don't even know where our rights come from. I would even go further and say people have rejected the source of those rights, right? As you can see sure. in the declining religiosity of the United States and the growing element of the nuns or whatever, N-O-N-E-S is, uh, of, of the atheists or agnostics here. Um, all those things have changed so fundamentally that it makes me wonder, it makes me ask a question that were the founders focused on creating a constitutional republic as they did as the top priority, or were they focused on creating the right government at the right time to protect natural rights as they saw it? And what would they what what was the priority? Was it the constitutional republic or was it the the custom fitting of the cloak to the people? Well, of course, it was the custom fitting of the cloak to the people as the immediate answer. But also, they were very conscientious of the historical moment that they were in and of the great historical leap they were making. I mean, America, they were not unaware of the fact that they were doing something really significant for the first time in history, right? The, the cloak has to fit the people, absolutely, no question about that. But also, as they, as they mentioned many times, they were vindicating for the first time the possibility of self-government, right? The whole history of feudal Europe was the rejection that the people could govern themselves. It was a rejection of natural rights. It was a rejection of equality of opportunity because of feudalism and a phony aristocracy of, of those European aristocrats and divine right of kings and all of that. So the founders were doing something very particular, suited for particular people, but it is also a, a gigantic historical step for the first time to say, you can build uh, a country on the basis of these of these enduring truths. You have to have people with the right habits and virtues and so forth, but it can be done, right? And so there's an important theoretical uh, achievement, uh, a, a world historical achievement that, that's happening there, even though the cloak doesn't fit everyone all the time. It doesn't hardly fit us at all. When I say <laughs> America right. is obese, uh, it is a both a metaphor and literal. And the idea yeah. here is is this crisis of obesity that we face is that, yeah, man, we the coat we have on is like busting at the seams. This, it's all splitting apart. It's all shredded. Looks dumb on us. It's awkward. It doesn't fit. And so the question and I mean, I can't get away. I can't get away from this question. Like I, I, I've been reading and thinking and talking, discussing it over and over again. Is it easier to change the people? Is it easier to change the government? Do we even need to? Can we can we persist in this condition, declining appreciation and belief in God, which is the source of the natural rights, which is the whole reason why Jefferson and them did the declaration to build this thing, which protects those rights, which come from God. People forget about God. They forget about the rights and they don't care about the right matter being shaped into the right form. All these things are adding up in a way that feels like a tectonic plates, just like building, just building and just building and something is going to give. So yep. where, you have thoughts on this? Like, what do you yeah, think? Right, so change the people change the form. What do we do? No, neither. It's what, this is what happens here. We'll I'll get back to the book a little bit. One of the epigraphs to the book is, uh, people has to be willing to fight for each other. You can't regard someone as a fellow citizen if he's not willing to fight for you. We're now moving to a state where people are more interested in fighting against each other. And so you have to ask the very basic question, are we still one people? Right? Now, uh, Ryan, you mentioned Ryan Williams, the president of Claremont Institute, got into a little bit of controversy. I didn't think it, what he said was controversial. He said, we're more divided now than the country was during the Civil War. And I absolutely agree with that. You know, Lincoln pointed out, despite the very, very important distinction about slavery and whether there's any 
right to enslave another human being, class of human beings. They did, as Lincoln said, pray to the same God, read the same Bible. There was no difference between North and South about you know, whether it would be a good idea to manipulate the sex hormones of a five-year-old or you know, all the other crazy things that the woke left believes that we can simply remake the world to suit our passions and desires, which is in a way insane at some level, right? Uh, even Barry Weiss is, is now saying that the woke left is just insane. So can you have, can you be fellow citizens with people who are insane? Um, and so we really have to get back to this fundamental question of, are we still one people? And so the question of, you know, the cloak or the person, uh, maybe it's neither because uh, we're no longer one one body. We, we can't wear the same clothes because we're not even one people anymore. So that then raises the question, well, what do we do about that? <laughs> What do we do about that? Indeed, sir, happens to be a very hot topic. It is the question of the day. I mean, one of the other questions of the day is who is an American, right? It's the same, the same, yep. uh, the same question here. And I and I have I have uh, asked that of people many times, and 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 I have colleagues that have you know said that this is the question that we failed to answer in the 20th century is who is an American, not who gets to be or who should be, but what is, who is an American? Uh, and then what is the government for? Is it for the American people who are the American people? And I'll tell you at the Claremont uh, fellowship this summer, we talked about all kinds of stuff during the day, a lot of theoretical, a lot of academic, a lot of historical stuff, but late at night with the wine at two in the morning, this is the question that came up over and over and over again. And uh, I think we all settled on like people that believe in the myths and the stories and the heroes of America, you know, uh, and, right. and there's a lot to say that the, 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 what, how many different mixed metaphors might come up, but the genie is out of the, the barn door, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's, it's, <laughs> right. it's all happened already. And what, you know, what are we going to do? And this is, this is where, you know, a lot of the extreme folks on the right get, you know, lose the plot. They're like, they, they want to just like roll back the clock 150 years or go through some insanely horrific force of evil to remedy this cloak and, and body uh, problem that we've got. But uh, it, it, I think it's going to take a little bit of a redefinition of who, uh, what an America is and then, and then enact like some sort of program to like get us all there. You know, it's going to take decades of, of uh, assimilation and repa repatriatism, if that's even a, a word, you know, rekindling the political religion or the adherence to the you know, reverence for the constitution and the laws and the blood that was shed in the revolution. Uh, these are lines from Washington and from Lincoln there with the political religion. And it, it's all tied together with God and religion, too, which is also the entire American story, which is another element of the book that I wanted to get to here. And maybe you can help me. I'm, I'm glossing over the, the, the answer. I almost said final solution. <laughs> I'm glossing over the answer uh, to the question that we just proposed, because there's really no good. There's really no good answer at this point. Right. 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 So we're, we're still in the identifying the problem phase uh, and then we'll see uh, and clearly defining the terms and then we'll see what comes up after that. But one of the most interesting threads that I found throughout the book was the connection between, uh, you know, Athens and Jerusalem and Rome and, and America or, or the Jews and the Romans and the Americans and, and the, 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 this, this sort of narrative arc, for lack of a better term, coming to mind right now, but the evolution from one city and one type of God versus the other city and their gods, then into Rome with the universality of their of their uh, government, with then the universality of Christianity, and then into the United States, where some people saw as a new Zion. Uh, can you help? Like I just summarized a lot of it, but can you help us? sort of talk about that story and let's just start all the way back with the, the polis or the polis and like there were, right. there were gods there and then there was a city over here and there were gods there. Let's, let's talk about that in the context of Jaffa and his understanding of this as well. Sure. Sure. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you just wrote a whole book on it, sir. So could you tell me about this in five minutes? <laughs> uh, I'll do my best. So uh, all the cities of the ancient world had their own gods. This is a really, it, Sounds a little abstract, but it turns out to be a really important little uh, way to begin the whole history of Western civilization. Even Jerusalem, even the Hebrews had their own God. Now there, it's a little different because the God they believed in was the God of the whole world, 
whereas all the other cities believed their god was just for them. So if you were Athens, you thought you had your own gods, Babylonians, Persians, Spartans, uh, Carthaginians, whatever. And your gods protected you and you worshiped them. And to be a citizen of Athens meant to worship the gods of Athens. And uh, there was no distinction between church and state. There was not much of a distinction between the, the private and the public. Piety was a public duty. Um, you know, if you were in that city, you worshiped those gods. And, that's, and to be a foreigner meant also to be a heretic, right? Because someone from another city who worshiped different gods was a heretic, right? They, they didn't believe in, in your gods. And that is the definition of citizenship. That becomes a very important thing because that gets totally transformed with the introduction of Christianity, right? Um, in the ancient city, when there's no conflict between state and religion, uh, between your obligations as a, as a citizen and your obligations that you have to God, there's a kind of a unity, right? The, the city has a kind of a wholeness. With the introduction of Christianity and the idea of one God for the whole Western civilization, uh, suddenly you have a possible disconnect between your obligations. So you could be a citizen of some little principality in, in Italy or in Germany or France, and your obligations to your prince are not necessarily the same as your obligations to God. And so now suddenly this disconnect really fundamentally changes politics, right? Uh, your political obligations and your religious obligations are not necessarily the same. There's a temptation to use politics to impose religious orthodoxy. So, you, you know, with the Reformation, you get fights between Catholics and Protestants. Um, the whole question of, of where does political authority come from creates tremendous problems. You know, you mentioned earlier, Jaffa was a big student of Shakespeare. And Shakespeare's history plays really show the problem when political authority comes from God and you have the divine right of kings, uh, you have no good way of getting the right person on the throne, right? Uh, Jaffa used to say, you have uh, no way of combining legitimacy and authority, right? So the heir to the throne, because the kings all said, you know, I'm descended from God and that's where my authority comes from. The heir to the throne might be a bully or a tyrant or an idiot or a weakling, right? Whereas the person who's really entitled to rule has no authority. And so the disconnect between the religious and the political, and it's, this doesn't mean Christianity is a problem per se, it just means the way Christianity uh, affects the politics of Europe becomes this tremendous problem. And this is, Jaffa goes on and explains this uh, in some detail in a lot better way than I could do it here. It's not till you get the idea of religious liberty with the founding that you solve this problem of people using political authority to punish heretics, you know, one uh, uh, religion punishing another. I used to, I like to say when I talk about this, the Catholics killed the Protestants, the Protestants killed the Catholics, and everyone killed the Jews. <laughs> and Jaffa was a Jew, so he was very well aware of this. Um, and so the end of polytheism and the introduction of Christianity creates this conflict that really doesn't get resolved for over a thousand years until the founding fathers say, okay, let's just separate these things. Let's separate church and state. Let's not use uh, government to punish heresy and give due respect to both of these areas. We'll keep political things in the political arena and we'll leave religion in the private sphere. That's a little bit more than five minutes, but that sets the stage for uh, I mean, why the is, American founding was so significant. This is, um, this is massive change, right? This is massive change yeah. that now yeah. has, ev it, 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 that connects us all the way back to Athens flows yep. through Jerusalem and then into into Rome and then over here to the United States and the universality this is the problem that I, I'm I'm trying I'm struggling with when you have a polytheistic universe you know it's totally normal that the guy next door has his own set of gods right and in fact they believe right. that the the citizens of the city came out of the soil that they lived on and they were there to worship the gods and if one city came over and conquered the other city they killed their gods and the, the citizens there took the new gods and it was just like that was just part of the thing right but now you've got Christianity, which is a monotheistic, universal, omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, higher power. And now you've got the United States 
in that same context, even though we've lost a lot of the sort of religiosity or adherence to God and whatever uh, among the citizens, built into the whole thing, right? Even though church and state were separated, it still was calling down from, from God the rights that we had and what we were doing to protect them. And to me, that is part of the, the source of the, the, the urge to just spread this thing all around the world, right? It's universal. One God, omniscient, omnipresent, omnipowerful, gave us reason to figure out our rights. We figured out what the rights are. We've established the system of government. If, you, if each one of those things you hold to be true, then don't we necessarily have to like push this all over the world? And if we push this all over the world, doesn't that run up against the idea, the negative idea put forth in the book about the uh, homogenized global government and global system? So I'm feeling tension there. I'm feeling tension there. Do you feel tension there? Help me understand this. I'm feeling a lot of tension. Yes. <laughs> no, you're you're absolutely right. This is this is a big problem uh, that that serious political philosophers, even students of Strauss and Jaffa, grapple with. Right. Uh, the world homogenous state, which is this this idea that comes out of the progress of history. Uh, you know, we're all going to keep getting enlightened and become more educated, and eventually, liberal democracy will spread all over the world. And once we all become uh, you know, brothers uh, in liberal democracy, we really only need one government. Um, but this, and so there is a kind of uh, coming both out of Christianity and out of the idea of, you know, universal truths accessible to reason and out of the idea, a, a little bit in the idea of the uni United States representing for the first time a new principle uh, of organizing people. There is this kind of push why shouldn't it spread around the whole world, right? There does seem to be that inherent impetus, Christianity, reason, universalism, uh, the idea that we all have our rights uh, by nature. There aren't any distinctions that automatically make one person the ruler of another. It does seem to point to a global regime. And yet Strauss said that the world homogenous state would be the end of philosophy on earth. Yeah, that's a problem. <laughs> and, and, and part of the problem is we, political philosophy needs diversity. It needs different regimes in order to do what it does, right? When everyone thinks the same way, in a way, it's the death of the mind, right? What Strauss meant when he said the world homogenous state would be the end of philosophy on earth is if everyone thinks the same, if there's just one opinion, uh, uh, it means the end of thinking in a way. It, well, so I, yeah, there is a tension there. I mean, it, it would be the end of thinking if everybody adopted uh, the Christian sense of God, the rights divine from reason and natural right, and then applied it to our. This is well. This is the part where I think that there's some play. Uh, you start with the omniscient, omnipresent, omnipowerful God, reason and natural rights, and you come to. But the next part, what type of regime is best to preserve? that is it exclusively a constitutional republic or are there alternative forms of government that can operate under this umbrella of god reason natural right and all the things that we've talked about from the founding from aristotle even though he was polytheist etc i still think he sees some of the same things that's why we're still talking about him sure. so yeah. what are there viable alternatives to the constitutional republic as devised in 1789 that respect back up the chain all the things that we're talking about yeah there can be uh, i mean joffa is clear on this uh you can have a just regime you can have a regime a regime that respects natural rights and that's not necessarily uh a constitutional republic you could in theory have a monarchy the problem is uh from the framers point of view from joffa's point of view is uh, all of them lapse even more quickly into problems, right? Aristocracy, especially. You know, you hear a lot of the younger guys on the distant right saying, oh, we want to go back to aristocracy or we want to have some kind of Red Caesar or something. 
The problem is all the alternatives to constitutional democracy are even weaker. As many as as problematic as it's turned out to be, that the American experiment seems to have sort of hit some rocks now after 200 years. Jaffa's argument, and I think the founder's argument, is the alternatives uh, are even less likely to last. Aristocracy, especially, very quickly lapses into oligarchy. Um, you know, the United States was supposed to be a natural, not an artificial, a natural aristocracy, and we seem to have lapsed into an oligarchy. Uh, monarchy, and I was talking a little bit earlier about the problem of divine right of kings, which you had under feudalism, that doesn't even last two or three generations. And you know, you see this with the great uh, wealthy plutocrats in American history, right? You might have some guy who's just, you know, gangbusters, builds a great empire, and by the time you get to his grandchildren, they're just totally dissolute and useless, right? And it's the same thing with inherited monarchy. So, you know, the, the alternatives to constitutional democracy are even more problematic, although in principle, you could have good alternatives. The question I like to ask people is, where do you find virtue most likely in the one, the few, or the many? What would Jaffa say? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. I mean, you can uh, you can find virtue in any human being. Um, you mean political virtue? Yeah, consistent enough virtue to enact a just regime, the one, the few, or the many. Um, what's, your, what's your winning so bet I, there? <laughs> Uh, look, if you wanted to, to have, uh, I mean, look, Aristotle says in, in principle, the, the absolute best regime is the Pambasalea, the one that the one all wise king. But even if you can find that, the problem is, what do you do with the succession problem, right? That's what I was just getting to. I mean, even if you could find someone who's virtuous enough and wise enough and restrained enough to rule uh, without the encumbrances of law, just on the basis of his own wisdom. What do you do when he dies? I mean, do you just rejigger the whole system and move to something else? Uh, so that's uh, one big problem with monarchy. Yeah, well, no doubt. There's problems there. There's problems in the oligarchy, as we're seeing right now, right? And then there's problems in a pure democracy, which are very obvious to anyone who thinks about it for two seconds. Right. It is, man, this is pessimistic. Is, is the... Re the Constitutional Republic that was devised 1789 based on natural right and, and a belief in the in the rights from given from God, the mon, monotheistic, omniscient, omnipresent, omnipowerful God. If that is if we created this thing and it's already the wheels are already coming off, the car's like the doors like flying off and we're going down the highway. And before all we are is like in a chair on like four wheels on the road, it feels like at this point. And if this was our best go then, man, sounds like we need to do a little bit more thinking. But people have been thinking about this for a long time. Who are we to think that we're going to come up with a better idea? Well, okay. So um, one answer to that is, and Jaffa talks about this, and I mentioned this a little bit in the book, is I mentioned that the founders created America before the introduction of this dogmatic idea of historicism, right? So Jaffa points out they didn't anticipate this problem, and so therefore they didn't plan for it. Now, in a way, that actually uh, can make you a little bit more optimistic, right? Because now we do see this, this bad modern theoretical idea, this philosophical error of historicism, and it it came in very conscientiously. The whole progressive movement, I'm sure you guys talked about this a little bit when you were in Claremont, the progressives very consciously brought in German historicism, the German idea of the state, and used it to attack American constitutionalism, right? So the regime didn't entirely lose the wheels and you know all the stuff went flying off the car on its own. It's because it was conscientiously attacked by this philosophical dogma. So to the degree that we understand that now, or if the founders had understood it, uh, you can respond to that, right? So you can, and if you understand how things work, uh, how the car is supposed to function, right? If you understand the mechanics, and that goes back to Aristotle, and these principles of political science. If you understand the principles and you understand how they got uh, screwed up and attacked, that gives you some way to to fix the problem, at least in theory, right? Yeah, and I and I think that um, some of our, uh, the more radical dissident right folks that are talking about a red Caesar aren't necessarily talking about to the return to uh, to the divine right of kings, 
But I think what they're acknowledging is that the administrative state, the bureaucratic technocracy that rules us by rule and fiat rather than by law and legislature, uh, that that system is so entrenched that you need somebody with enough power that they're able to just take it all down and sort of reset the clock on the uh, constitutional republic that we have. I don't think, and I, and I don't read every essay that Yarvin puts out. I do read a number of no, that dude. That dude writes more than I even think out. I think uh, yeah. that that uh, that that he's saying that we need to have like a lifelong dictator who's kept alive through cryogenics and brain uploaded to the to the matrix so they can rule us in perpetuity. Although, if you did find the right guy, that's not a terrible idea. I do think that's actually the foundation of the foundation, right, uh, of that series there. Um, but oh, Asimov. Yeah. Yeah, I think the rulers are cloned because they were found to be perfect and they're cloned and just recycled oh. over and over again. Uh, and so there was always three of them. There's like the kid that's just been born, the middle-aged man and the man who's on his deathbed. And it's the same the same genes and they just sit together and they rule together. It's an interesting concept, but um, which <laughs> would actually be some of the solutions to some of the things that we're talking about if you do find that one perfect guy, right? But of course, there's no one who's perfect and no system is perfect. And Aristotle laid out the cycle and shows that we're just in that, we're just in the process, right? So if nothing, if human nature stays the same, but time marches on, then that cycle that Aristotle pointed out is probably going to happen, which means that the democracy or representative democracy that we had is probably devolving into some form of tyranny, and then we're going to reset the whole the whole clock. That sounds like a really rough time to live through. Uh, I'm not super <laughs> excited about that, but I do consider these ideas and do think about them quite a bit. And the the time scale we're working on here, you know, I, I don't know that all this is going to happen in the next three or four or five years, but it does feel like we're accelerating a little bit. Do you do you get that sense that things are accelerating and that oh. some of these problems we're addressing are becoming just so evident that they can't even be ignored anymore? Yeah, I mean, I think the acceleration is just mind boggling. Every week I see what the Biden administration is doing and I'm astonished. I you know, I was a, a Soviet studies strategic IR person as an undergrad in the 80s. And so I studied a lot a little about the Soviet Union and how it worked and, and you know, the way they use propaganda. And I keep thinking, we're living under the old Soviet Union between the propaganda and, you know, the idea that, uh, you know, you're representing anti-party evolution, anti-revolutionary elements. Uh, therefore, you lose all your privileges as a citizen. I mean, the, the the divisiveness, the propaganda, the 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 politicization of of our of our police and our justice system and the military, yeah, it's accelerating at an alarming rate. I mean, every week that goes by, I I think it's it's astounding. It is so, a, yeah. it is astounding, and it's got people uh, who you know are ostensibly American and believe in America, love America, all that, talking about what a post liberal world looks like. And I think that there's some valid criticism to say that the system we created gave us this net result that we're living in. So therefore, is it really that awesome? Uh, I think that that's a valid criticism. I mean, whether or not it was hijacked or it's misapplied or whatever, it's still allowed. It, it still permitted this. I mean, the Civil Rights Act and the Immigration Acts of the 60s were voted on in Congress. Right. And those would represent yeah. fundamental changes to the nature of America. Kessler points out, Charles Kessler points out that it created basically two constitutions within the United States. Uh, the demographic changes brought to the United States from the Immigration Act are just astounding. I gave a speech, a little lecture at University of Maryland the other day, and uh, you know they couldn't believe that America was ninety percent white up until nineteen sixty five. It's kind of nuts to think about it, uh, because of of what I guess it's now one in four people in the United States are are, are living in a household headed up by a foreign born resident, and and this is not xenophobia or anything. This is just facts. We're just talking about the facts and how things have changed. So, the system gave us what we've got now, which makes people wonder if the system is worthwhile. You've got the post-liberal folks talking on all sides. You've got the Dugans of the world talking, the Amaris and the Deneens and the Vermules of the world talking 
about what a post-liberal world looks like. And I think in my uh, talk with Sorab Amari, I asked him, uh, how do you square uh, the like Dugan's idea of a multipolar world with the universal God of Catholicism. And he didn't have a really good answer there. And even Dugan himself is an Orthodox, right? He's Orthodox Christian and he's putting out ideas of a multipolar world. I don't understand how to square that. Uh, my friend, Michael Millerman, who should definitely be at Claremont next summer, guys, uh, he would say, I think paraphrasing Dugan that, the sun shines over uneven terrain, which is kind of a cryptic way of saying that, like, there may be the universal truth there, but, uh, you know, people are in different times and places to receive it, oh, and therefore yeah. it gets translated right. differently. Um, do you have any experience uh, in reading or processing Deneen's, you know, end of liberalism and Amari and these guys and thinking about what may or may not or even if it should be a, a post-liberal world? Uh, my criticism of them a little bit is uh, I don't know that they know that much about the history of political philosophy. And, and you know, one of the nice things about this, this story of, of Christianity and going back to ancient Athens and Jerusalem and Rome and Jaffa, you know, traces this whole development. And, and Strauss does this, too, uh, understanding the whole development of modern philosophy. When you see that and when you and you go all the way back and you trace the steps and you see all the various wrong turns, it gives you a much keener appreciation for why the framers came up with liberal democracy. It gives you a much keener appreciation, as I was saying a moment ago, for the deficiencies of the, of the alternatives. It's very easy to say, oh, this broke, you know, let's do this other thing. Well, there's very good reasons why that other thing was not considered desirable by Jefferson, right? Very good reasons why that other thing, you know, Strauss and, and Jaffa were very skeptical about. Um, and so, you know, I think a, a better appreciation for the whole history of political philosophy and the history of the political developments in the West would make you uh, a little bit more suspicious about how easy or simple these alternatives are. Yeah. I think they're very much in a theoretical phase. And I don't know that there's yeah. much, I don't know that there's much uh, public support for Catholic integralism or what Omari lays out as what did he call it uh, political Catholicism, but I do get what they're what they're aiming at, which is that the the liberal democracy that we have in the in the United States, where the social life, the extended sphere, wasn't anchored or hasn't been permanently anchored in an appreciation or reverence for God and the morality and the virtues that come after that, uh, and so. Because of uh, the way that the government was created, and John Adams said it very clearly over and over and over again, that the republic is fit for a moral and virtuous people, it's pretty clear that we are not as much of a moral and virtuous people as we were in 1789. And so I can see where Amari and those guys would come at this, this solving this problem by trying to reimpose or reimpose is a, is a wrong word. That's sort of a negative perception of it, but like to expand the good word of God and their Catholic religion such that the moral and, you know, virtuosity, morality and virtuosity of the people was sufficient enough, sufficient enough to honor the system that was created. I mean, I think that, that modern Americans, myself included, up until just maybe five years ago and definitely in the last year, do not have any appreciation for how religious these folks were in 1789 and how much time they spent yeah. in church and how much time they spent going over all the virtues and morals and writing down the rules and George Washington, like handwriting over and over again, 99 rules of, of behavior, like details like never bring your mouth to your fork, you know, like never, never, do this. <laughs> never do this, always do this, you know, and, and like all the way down right. to that level. I mean, you know, I do my best to teach my kids this kind of stuff, but it's not, it's not like that, you know, it's, it's not like that. And, uh, I, I feel it, you know, I, uh, I went through a very clear, you know, atheistic hedonistic time period where I sought out the pleasures of the flesh and tried to tried to find meaning and value and all of that and self-worth. And it didn't work in case anybody was, was uh, tempted to give that a shot. Uh, I can tell you it didn't work. It didn't work. Uh, I achieved all the things that a hedonist would want to achieve. And I still was left with like, okay, 
what what's next what what's missing in here and slowly but surely i've been trying to fill it up bit by bit uh be, by becoming a little bit more reverent so i can understand uh where they're coming from on that perspective the guardrails have been removed that were essential to create the matter that fits the form of the government that we have and until we have a um, a a a countrywide accepting acceptance of that notion i don't think uh much is much is going to change um do you have any comments on my rant just then because we're just now wrapping up my first question by the way (laughs) um yeah no i agree with all of that i mean uh uh, another lesson from Jaffa about about the people who want to sort of withdraw is you may not be interested in politics but politics will always be interested in you um and you know to the degree that we live in a world in which china is emerging year after year as a stronger and stronger power um we can't simply you know even if you wanted to turn your back on the american regime you can't turn your back on the rest of the globe um and so in a way escaping from politics is never a human option uh so that's that's one response to that yeah definitely not combine it with uh, marshall McLuhan's ideas that the world third world war is going to involve basically everybody with no distinction between uh civilian or military combatant or otherwise i mean politics is interested in you identity politics are interested in you this third world information right. war is interested in you there's really no avoiding it at all uh you know i i'm i'm looking at property in appalachia i want to move in we're going to make this all happen even then it's still not going i'm not going to be able to hide from it right it's just uh right. maybe getting out of the Getting out of the, the depths of this blue hell of Washington, D.C., which just degrades, gets worse every single day. Okay, so that was question one. <laughs> uh, I recently was a Lincoln Fellow 2021 for Claremont. One little critique I will give of the program is that mm-hmm. it was Lincoln Light. There was, like the, the focus on Lincoln, the namesake... It wasn't necessarily there. We did a couple sections on it. We had a day on it or whatnot. Uh, It did seem designed very much to get us up to speed on the current problems and the historical roots and to give you the weapons that you need to make the arguments out in the marketplace of ideas, which I, I believe they've definitely done a great job. But Jaffa is known for writing books on Lincoln. And I would like, yep. if you could, please, to help ex- help the audience understand, uh, can you explain Jaffa's understanding of Lincoln's significance? And could you put it in the context of, well, as uh, from Aristotle to Jefferson to, to today and that link in the middle, if there is one? And just give me your, give me your take on, on Jaffa's weight or analysis of Lincoln's value to the United States, aside from, you know, the obvious. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> Jaffa, just, a, just an easy uh, one. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, and then placing him in the context of, of, of Aristotle and, and Christianity. You know. So, uh, maybe helpful just to tell a little, uh, quick story of how Jaffa changed his mind on Lincoln. That might, that might be useful. So, please, uh, um, early on, um, uh, Jaffa had learned from Strauss this idea that modern philosophy sort of lowered the sights of human life, right? It's, it, never mind virtue and the soul, just focus on the needs of the body. This is in the ways the whole modern project that begins with Machiavelli and Hobbes. Um, just, just focus on satisfying our, our bodily needs and never mind about being good. Argument that sees America as part of this, right? America is based on, on Locke. It's just about acquisition. It's just a bit based on self-interest. And so, yes, there's the rule of law. But there's really nothing higher. There's nothing nobler, uh, and that uh, the American founding just represents this low but solid horizon of the modern world. And Jaffa partook of this, but sees in Lincoln uh, a very uh, grand statesmanlike elevation of America, as you know, bringing out the highest possibilities of, of justice. Uh, he talks in his first Lincoln book about Lincoln as a Messiah, as a savior, because. He takes this element of of justice, especially equality and equal rights out of the Declaration, and brings that to bear. And and Jaffa sees the Civil War as kind of a um, a baptism in blood to purify the nation of the original sin of slavery. 
he modifies that a little bit by uh, coming to, to study the founding a little closer. Lincoln himself had said he took all of his political principles from Jefferson. Lincoln himself thought he was vindicating the principles of the founding, but Joppa didn't really take that seriously at first, and then goes back and looks and sees that those elements were already there in the beginning. The word I use in the book is, in the beginning was the word, right? That it wasn't Lincoln in, in bringing this into the regime from outside through his own greatness, but drawing out elements that were already there in the beginning. And so Jaffa comes to a much more sophisticated appreciation of the founder's emphasis on virtue and religion. You know, the, the, the line at the end of the Declaration of Independence about our sacred honor, right? These are men who actually cared about honor, which is a very uh, classical idea, right? Very much against this low but solid idea. And um, so he, Jaffa still sees Lincoln as the great statesman, um, but not no longer rescuing America from its sort of low origins. The other big element is Lincoln as the great poet of the regime. And I think this is what's relevant maybe today. And one of our challenges today and why I don't think, every time people say, what do we do? And my, always, my answer is always, we sort of need a statesman who has the peculiar genius and I'm not that statesman and I can't supply it. One of the things that makes a great statesman and, and the great virtue that Lincoln has, he could talk to people in a way they understood. And one of the challenges we have today is we don't seem to have the idiom, the language to talk to people, right? Lincoln to talk, could talk to people in the language of the King James Bible. He could bring the, the, the poetry of the regime to bear through his rhetorical powers in a way that really made people understand and, and, and you know, gave their patriotism uh, a transcendent quality. I don't know how a statesman would do that today. But then again, I don't have that peculiar genius. Um, but Lincoln's uh, understanding of the principles of the regime, along with his great rhetorical powers as the great poet, of the American regime is is something that Jaffa bring, brings out really well, I think. Jaffa has a very extreme appreciation for poetry, an essential component to understanding our the good life and understanding and political philosophy. And and he focused a lot on Shakespeare, which was uh, that, that was sort of new to me, which was uh, viewing Shakespeare as a great political philosopher. Can you share yeah. a little bit about Jaffa's understanding of Shakespeare and why he found him to be so important? Yeah, so I touched a little bit earlier about uh, the history plays. So, you know, all those Richards and Henrys and a couple others uh, really bring out uh, the problems of feudalism and the divine right of kings, right? Uh, he sees the same problem in a way that Machiavelli does. So. Machiavelli, in, in Strauss's history of political philosophy, the big break comes with Machiavelli, who sees that the effect that Christianity has on politics is to distort the proper understanding of political power, political authority. It either makes men too cruel because they want to use political authority to punish heresy, right? So you have people burned at the stake, you have the Inquisition, uh, because you're, you're mixing politics and religion in a way that can lead to great cruelty, or you have too much weakness, right? You have some political rulers who just want to go to church and pray and be pious, and the whole regime, the whole regime goes to pot because they, they, they think they're priests rather than princes. And Machiavelli says he becomes a great critic of Christianity itself. He says Christianity has had a terrible influence on modern politics. Let's just get rid of it. And by the way, this whole classical emphasis on virtue and the good life that's useless to let's just let's just focus on the here and now let's just be strict and hard and tough and we can actually improve people's lives but get rid of all this other stuff shakespeare as Jaffa understands it sees the same problem he sees the why political authority can never really get any good solid ground the problem of divine right of kings um, but he doesn't quite, so the way Joff explains it is he almost sees the solution that the American founders have, but doesn't quite get there. So that's on the history play. The other part are the tragedies and the comedies are also, in a way, commentaries on this Machiavellian solution. Uh, and Jaffa has a wonderful analysis of, of, especially Measure for Measure, but some of the, of the, of, of the other plays show in a kind of a playful, poetic way, 
what could happen if philosophers ruled, right? And, and Measure for Measure is one, and, and The Tempest, and, and, and uh, some of the others. He plays with this, this idea of what if a philosopher could solve our problems. But the comedies and the tragedies both, in a way, show that it's really problematic to see how this is ultimately going to work. And it's a very platonic idea, right? Uh, there will always be injustice in the world until philosophers become kings. But generally, philosophers don't become kings. <laughs> but, but along the way, in showing us this, Shakespeare shows a great insight about the nature of human life, the nature of justice, the nature of love and friendship, political themes that other people don't really appreciate as being uh, quite so prominent in the plays. And that I think Joppa does a, a great job of bringing out. I think we're, we're lacking a poet like that today. Uh, and even if you yeah. trans, you translate it into, you know, movie producer or author or whatever it is. Um, I haven't, I mean, I did put out a call for dissident art, dissident music on my podcast a while back. And people have been sending me, sending me different artists to listen to. And, uh, Tom McDonald is somebody that's really helped me understand that there is a, and you, you probably don't have any idea who that is. Uh, he, he's helped me understand that there is sort of a genre of this, uh, pop, pop music that, that is synthesizing the politics of today and expressing it in a relatable emotional way through art and song and lyric. Uh, and, uh, Tom McDonald, I, I rock out to Tom McDonald all the time. Now he is right on the edge. Like he is, he has got it. So it, if anybody I've, I've discovered out there is making just the art, the art that speaks to this, uh, Tom McDonald is one. Arthur Kwan Lee is another one. He's a visual artist uh, from New York. Uh, just a fantastic artist who was in the whole art scene and doing great. And then they found out he was conservative and they blacklisted him and he's been kicked out, but his art, his art is beautiful. It speaks to masculine energy and historic figures and conservative ideology. And just through his mastery of technique is trying to as well express an appreciation for ancient truths and objective uh, beauty standards and things like that. All of what is missing from the you know progressive bull crap uh, that we get thrown our way all the time. Um, it's fascinating to me how all of this is is all similar same themes, which tells me that they're probably accurate. <laughs> is that like? There are universal truths. There are universal standards of of, uh, of excellence. There are universal standards of beauty and aesthetics and art and music, and things that need to be uh, uh, striven towards and 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 an ideal worth working towards, that has been largely pushed pushed aside and replaced with slop and garbage and tampons from from light fixtures and bananas on walls and trashy <laughs> ass music and movies that are about heroes that don't do heroic things and uh this is all part of the problem that we're facing and um it all comes back to just taking back stepping back for a second and just being like wow you know not everything old is bad and not everything new is good and if we just start from that as like the foundation, uh, your mind can really open up to a lot of things that are going to sing true and, and come with resonance. And that may be one of the biggest challenges we have is, is, is opening up people's minds. Again, it's the idea that Strauss even had a point to make, which is that the ancients were worth studying. <laughs> like, again, I just say right, it out loud right. and it just makes me chuckle because it seems absurd. It seems absurd to me. And it's, all coming together for me, at least, uh, my personal experience through pleasure and hedonism, finding it to be hollow, my appreciation and understanding for the founders and their appreciation for morality and virtue and the necessity of such for our form of government, uh, tying it back to, is it Nicomachean, Nicomachean, whatever the ethics from Aristotle, Nicomachean, yeah, Nicomachean. Yeah, yeah. I've heard it said 10,000 different ways. Uh, tying it all together to understanding the honor and courage and strength and loyalty and all these things are, are universal and were, were understood as valuable thousands of years ago. And now I'm reading the Bible and I'm seeing all the same truths in there as well. Uh, so 
in some ways, you know, I'm, I'm an avatar for this transformation that's happening inside or the need for it. And uh, for better or worse, I'm living it all out on social media, Glenn, <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's, uh, I'm not doing yeah. it in a, in a private way. Uh, but, uh, that's, that's where I ended up. That's where I ended up. So here I am. Yeah. Uh, the only thing I can guarantee you is that I'm being honest, even if things are changing all the time. Um, who do you think is carrying on the intellectual tradition of Harry Jaffa? You had Strauss and then Jaffa, and there were a few other of Straussian acolytes. There was the split. There's a schism that you talk about. There's a conflict still to this day. Um, talk a little bit about the split, the East, the West split, the Jaffa, who's the neck, and then end, end it with, I'm giving you a nice runway here. Who's going to be the next? Who's the one to carry on the Jaffa, the Strauss Jaffa torch? All right, we'll start with the split. Um, so uh, Strauss developed a school reviving political philosophy, and it goes off in a couple di different directions. I mentioned that others had studied America besides Jaffa, but one faction said, okay, uh, political philosophy is still philosophy. And the concern with politics is sort of secondary. Uh, Strauss's concern was always with the life of the mind, with philosophy as the best way of life, uh, with understanding theoretical truth. And his concern with politics was sort of secondary. I mean, you know, the life of politics is separate from the life of philosophy. And Strauss was always fundamentally a philosopher. And so there's a whole uh, faction which are called East Coast Straussians because Jaffa was in California, and he's the founder of the West Coast Straussians, which are the more political factions. But the Easterners say, no, politics, that stuff is really not really the concern of the philosophers. We're just concerned with theoretical truth, with reading old books. Uh, and Jaffa's criticism of that was, well, you know, <laughs> again, you may want to ignore it, but it's not going to ignore you. And now I think we're seeing that as even, you know, the universities now are, are uh, uh, being shanghaied, uh, academic freedom is under assault. You know, the, uh, this idea that you can just hide in your ivory tower and read old books and practice philosophy is becoming really untenable. And so Jaffa's West Coast School was much more focused on applying the lessons of political philosophy to politics, but also in seeing politics as informing philosophy. He really thought statesmanship, moral excellence, uh, the, the great field of noble action that, that politics can present also informs philosophical understanding of human nature and the whole and the soul and things like that. So he thought there was a reciprocal relationship. Who's next? Well, you know, uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of us uh, in and affiliated with Claremont uh, who are trying to carry on Jaffa's legacy. I hope I've done my little bit here with the book. Mike Anton, a friend of mine, is a very smart guy. Uh, you know, it, there's, there's a lot of us who are sort of uh, doing our best to carry on Jaffa's legacy, doing smart, useful things. Uh, maybe someone will emerge as primus inter pares. I don't know. Uh, we'll have to find out. Anton's got to get his PhD first, I think, if he's gonna if he's gonna claim that crown. Yeah, he's got some work to do. He's uh, I don't know that he even did his qual, so he's, he's, he's got to get on it. Uh, the banker philosopher, Michael Anton. I really like that guy quite a bit. I've had him on the show. I enjoyed his books and I enjoy his writings and I read all of his articles and I had a wonderful time talking to him, uh, especially late night in Las Vegas during fellowship last summer. Uh, great guy, big thinker, love talking to him. I'm only giving him a hard time because I like him. Uh, the, <laughs> I promise. <laughs> the uh, and pardon me, guys. I definitely am coming down with a cold here. I'm talking through it. I apologize. Uh, I guess one last thing to get to. I mean, there's so many different things we could talk about. But one last thing I want to get to is is this today the state of today, and the way that that uh, you described it in the postscript of the book, uh, the holy city of anti-racism. Now we we have already established the the ancient idea that the city had its own gods and everybody else wasn't just a foreigner, but, uh, you know, uh, not just a, you know, an outsider, but like literally foreign, you know, and, and there were rights and rituals, you know, specific to that city. And if you weren't in, you were definitely out. 
Uh, and now we're in a new atheistic environment where these people on the left, the, the Antifas and the BLMs of the world and the CRT pushers, uh, not religious, not citing God, not looking towards the Bible, but creating their own religion, their own city yeah. and their own ideas. Talk to me about the holy city of anti-racism. Where we, where are we? I love that phrase, by the way. Uh, where are we today with all this? You know, what did you mean by that saying? And let's dig in a little bit about the current times, man. Sure, sure. So, you know, the whole origin of of the liberal project is, uh, in a way, to um, to justify people doing whatever they want, right? Um, and so. I know relativism is kind of a cringe word today, but that's the word that Strauss and Jaffa use. But we could say positivism, or we could say, you know, do your own thing, or it, and and ultimately this this leads to nihilism, which is probably another word. I mean, you sort of talking about your own sort of flirting with that. But one of the things Jaffa taught, and also a, a co-teacher he had named Harry Newman, who emphasized this a great deal, is people ultimately can't be nihilists, and this is the great truth that I think we're now seeing with the left. The whole experiment with uh, relativism and just do your own thing and you know you know just hyper tolerance of whatever that liberalism wanted to achieve in the 60s turns out not to work because people can't believe in nothing we're just not spiritually built to believe in nothing on the other hand the left can't go back to traditional christianity you know uh, the founding uh, uh, you know traditional morality they they're dogmatically committed to rejecting all that so what happens when there's a hole in your soul, but you can't go back to Christianity and morality and the, you know the, the 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 habits and mores of your grandparents? You have to come up with something else, and so you turn your political ideology into a religion. And I think that's what we're seeing. I mean, many other people have pointed out wokeness is a kind of religion. It has sin. It has damnation. Right. It has kind of a priesthood. But in a way. It's pre-Christian, right? It, it, it's it's maybe it's a perversion of Christianity, but what I see is going back to the ancient city is they want to build a little community. They want to be the ancient polis, right? We're a little community. We're militants. We fight for our gods, and anyone who has a different god is a heretic. And that's really, in a way, I think, captures something about the left. It's a revival of this ancient belief in the small, militant ancient city, which is passionately devoted to its gods. I can agree with all of that, sir. I have uh, wrote a book called Democrats of Deplorable, so I am already an apostate to them, and uh, I am the worst kind uh, of person. Apostate is, is definitely the worst. So I willingly walked out of there, right? Right around the same time as they kicked me out, just <laughs> as, it, as it were. Uh, and I have suffered uh, at the hand of their desire to extinguish everybody and anybody that disagrees with them. I've been doxxed. I've been attacked. They've come after me and my family. They've gotten between me and my kids. Uh, and uh, the, it doesn't stop. Funny enough, I get attacks from the trad cath right as well, too. So I'm getting I'm getting attacks from all over the place, which, as you know, means maybe I'm doing something right. Uh, it is absolutely true that they are setting up the walls. They have their rights and rituals. And if you're not in with them, you're definitely on the outs. And if you're on the outs, we're going to kill you. And that that's basically yeah. where it is. Now, the most concerning part about this is that it's not just one little group. It's not just at one university. It's not just a town in Ohio from, you know, just random choice, Kentucky, wherever. Uh, nothing bad about Ohio, guys. Had J.D. Vance on the show. Hope he gets elected. Um, it's that they're taking over the federal government, dude. <laughs> they're taking over the federal government yeah. and the military and the IRS and OSHA and the Office of Civil Rights and Congress and all of the bureaucracy in the deep state CIA, FBI, which means that they can fulfill their desires uh, to extinguish the uh, enemies of their city, their holy city of anti-racism. Uh, they're actually going to have the weapons and the tools and the powers to do that. And if they have completely captured all of the institutions that we have in America, education, media, corporations, all of them, it is uh, a terrifying prospect to face. Now, I think in your book, you address this unlikely alliance between the foot soldiers of the radical left and the corporations. Now, do you see that as, or and would Jaffa see that? Uh, how do we see this? Is that a, a sustainable alliance? Because it's clearly in place right now. Is it a sustainable yeah. alliance? Because if it is, dude, I think we're fucked. 
but if it can be severed, I think that there is some hope. What do you think? Yeah, I, I'm not sure it's sustainable. I mean, you know, uh, the oligarchy has very different operating principles. It has very different you know, values, to use a modern term. Um, it, first of all, it becomes very dangerous to empower mobs to push your political agenda on the assumption that you can control them. So, you know, uh, we know that only one side of the political spectrum now is allowed to have mobs, and that's the left. But, um, you know, it, it's not such, it's not so obvious that they, that they will control them long term, uh, having now legitimate, I mean, basically, we, we're told in this country that it's legitimate to engage in lawless behavior and destructive behavior if you're on the left. Well, you know, a lot of people have been told that now. And, you know, the idea that you're going to keep these people on a leash <laughs> may not work. Um, you know, the, the oligarchy uh, wants uh, consumers and workers. The woke left, it, again, is responding to kind of spiritual emptiness. And so there's, there's a clash there. Uh, and I'm not sure it's going to work out. And that may end up uh, working to the benefit of those of us who are anti-woke and anti-oligarch. Uh, who may find the possibility to exploit something there. Can I just add one other little thing that sort of came up in some of your early, is long before Jordan Peterson came along, Joff was also making this point in, in reference to classical philosophy. You know, Peterson likes to say, before you can fix the world, you have to fix yourself. Uh, I don't know how many people probably know that sort of generally about Peterson's 12 step for life. And Joff makes the same point. And the way he did it was by pointing to Aristotle and saying, the ethics and the politics form a kind of reciprocal relationship, right? First, you fix yourself, you become virtuous, uh, you develop the habits necessary to be a good citizen, and then and then you can work on, on uh, your regime. And both of those are important. And the idea of withdrawing from politics and just getting strong, right? Just becoming like an anti-political, swole, distant right, isn't really an answer because you know, ultimately you wanna become a good person in order to be a good citizen, right? Uh, you want to be strong in order to help other people. You want to be strong in order to fix your community. But both of those things are important. And Jaffa made this point a long time ago, and I think it's that's it's important to remember both pieces of that. A hundred percent. And I'm going to do my own shameless plugging on my own show, which is okay. We have operationalized that idea in the liminal order. It is a collection of men acting intentionally with shared values, masculinity, brotherhood, and sovereignty, and all that's contained therein, honor, courage, strength, loyalty, service, accountability, et cetera, et cetera. And we are practicing these. We are developing these virtues in us on a daily basis in ourselves. And the, and the, and the idea that we give everybody is the same thing. You got to start with yourself first. You have to start with yourself first. You have to get in the squat rack. Saving the world starts in the squat rack. I believe that 100%. It's pithy. It's awesome. But it's true. Yep. And, and we do that to be of better service to other people. We're not trying to run away and hide. What we are trying to do is gather strength so that we can be Gandhi, be the change that you wish to see in the world, be that strong man, develop those, uh, you know, you know, beauty, uh, art based on aesthetics, you know, be the community. Well, first the family that you want to have, then be the community that you want to see. And then hopefully we can have an impact on the nation. That's liminal hyphen order.com guys. And it is, uh, where we are trying to operationalize so much of all these things that we've been talking about. And this conversation is doing a good job of putting into the context, historical context, the philosophical context of why it's important. We're not outwardly uh, a religious organization, but we are, we emphasize the spiritual life. Uh, you know, we have Christians and Catholics and we have uh, some agnostics. There are no militant atheists though. Uh, and we do emphasize like, look, if you, if you don't believe in God, then at least meditate and get outside and do community service and do something that gets you outside of yourself. And, uh, these are the, the, the foundation blocks by which we're building a whole new community, a whole new culture. And, uh, we've got 800 guys now, and there's like 8,000 guys waiting on the wait list to get in. And we let in 50 every month. And, uh, the, the demand for it seems endless because, I think we're tapping into something universal and something that rings true and uh, proves the the hypothesis is proven every single day here uh, in 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 culture and especially with the diminishment of masculine energy. And so the the holy city of anti-racism 
has come down upon us and they're looking at us and they're ready to cast us out. And we're trying to do our best uh, to, to either prevent that or to, to build the polis of our, of our values. Right. And in this uh, 2021 environment, that doesn't necessarily mean you're living right next door to people, but maybe an archipelago uh, of people connected by technology and values uh, in a way that was uh, so just not possible uh, in the past. So, I think we've covered almost everything. I mean, we could dig, dig down on so many other elements, but I want to just put the book up for people again. It's The Soul of Politics. The Soul of Politics by Glenn Elmers. It's about Harry V. Jaffa and the fight for America. A fantastic book. I couldn't put it down. I've gone back and reread several of the sections multiple times. Um, we could do a whole discussion on the tension between reason and revelation. I think that that is an interesting subject as well. Uh, but uh, maybe we save that one for the next time, Glenn. Um, I really appreciate you coming down here, sir. I, well, coming down. <laughs> I appreciate you talking to me from the comfort of your own home, right. sir. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you. Great, great conversation. Great questions. I really appreciated it. Yeah, my pleasure. Where can people find you? You're not even on social media, are you? What kind of weirdo are you, dude? I I was off for a long time, but I got on to promote the book. So I'm on Facebook under my own name. I'm on Twitter as soul underscore politics. Uh, I have the picture of the book as my, as my uh, photograph. Um, that's about it. Uh, and then website of the Claremont Institute, if you want sort of more of my writings are there too. Fantastic. Uh, you are working with Arthur Millick at the Center for American Way of Life, right? Is that what it's called? The sort right. of Cl yep. Claremont, yep. Here in Claremont, DC, yep. Claremont East without being East Coast Straussian, right? <laughs> right, <laughs> right, right. Uh, I'm, I'm starting to feel more comfortable understanding that distinction. I think it's going to be even more important to understand moving forward. Again, the book is Soul of Politics. Glenn Elmer, senior fellow at the Claremont Institute. Thank you very much, sir. I really appreciate it. Uh, everybody go out there Thank and buy you. the book. Guess what? I got a copy of it right here. And I got it underlined and I got it tabbed. And there's all kinds of amazing stuff in there. You could You could use this as a springboard into studying basically everything and anything that has anything valuable to do with America and the American project. Uh, so please go ahead and get that guys. Uh, also, if you're interested and you should be in community and fellowship, please come to our Jack brunch events. We have the next one coming up in Nashville two weeks after that in Austin, then in Northern California. After that, we go to Denver, LA, Seattle, and then back to Washington, DC liminal order that's liminal hyphen order.com and uh with that guys uh we are out on this show we're driven by curiosity we want to chart a path forward best people best conversations we're on a journey and it's just getting started 